right, all right. Good evening, everybody. Are we good to go? Jerry, you're good? Team, good. Everyone's good. Well, welcome back to our Wednesday night study. We are on part seven of our Revelation series, and uh, it's great to have everyone here tonight. I really, really appreciate you guys that come and, and attend. Uh, I had talked with our team last year or earlier this summer and knew we were going to teach through the book of Revelation, and, you know, Jerry, our production director, was he was so big, like, on, hey, we'll record each message, we'll make sure that the content's available, but it's always nice just to see people show up hungry for God's Word. You know, you can put videos out, but it's another thing when we get together and study. So we're going to start in uh, chapter 2 of Revelation. We are picking up now on the fourth of the seven churches that Jesus addresses. Tonight, we're going to read verses 18 all the way to verse 29. And uh, each week, we've been going through each church, and so tonight is the uh, fourth church. My wife kicked us off with Ephesus, and then we talked about Smyrna. Last week was Pergamum, and then tonight, we're getting into the church of Thyatira, and um, it's been a really, really fun time so far. I got to tell you, I've never been challenged as much as I have been studying the book of Revelation, and so putting Sunday sermons together is fun, and I love to preach, but man... This is different, so uh, I appreciate you guys just being here for this. As we go through this whole year, because the goal is to get through the whole book this year, um, there may be some Wednesdays where I ask somebody else to teach. If, if no one else teaches, there may be some Wednesdays where we just pre-record a message. So, like, I know I have travel this year where I'll miss a few Wednesdays during the year, but we are committed to getting through this book. And so I don't want you to miss a Wednesday, and we will keep growing it together. So, Revelation chapter 2, uh, starting in verse 18. What I'll do is read through the whole section we're going to cover. I'll pray, and then we'll go through it one by one. And it'll be great. Here reads the word of the Lord. And to the angel of the church of Thyatira, write the words of the son of God who has eyes like a flame of fire and whose feet are burnished bronze. Remember each church that Jesus addresses, he describes himself in a different way. And so to one church, he says, the one that has the sword coming out of his mouth. Another one, he says, the first and the last. When he writes to Thyatira, verse 18, it says, the words of the son of God, whose eyes are like flame of fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. I know your works, your love and your faith and service and patient endurance. And I know that your latter works exceed the first, but I have this against you. You tolerate that woman, Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess and is teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent, but she refuses to repent of her sexual immorality. Behold, I'll throw her onto a sick bed and those who commit adultery with her, I will throw into great tribulation unless they repent of her works and I will strike her children dead. And all the churches will know that I am he who searches minds and heart, and I will give to each of you according to your works. That's the rebuke. And then watch what he says to the other side of the church. He says, but to the rest of you in Thyatira who do not hold this teaching, who have not learned what some call the deep things of Satan, to you I say, I do not lay on any other burden, only hold fast what you have until I come. To the one who conquers and he who keeps my works until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations and he will rule them with a rod of iron as when earthen pots are broken in pieces, even as myself has received authority from my father. And I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the spirit says to the churches. Let's pray. Father, help us tonight. Thank you uh, for this fourth church, the church of Thyatira. We know, God, that you are speaking not just to the church back then, but even to the church now. The attributes, the characteristics of Thyatira are still present in this world today. And so help us uh, learn, help us understand, and give us eyes to see and ears to hear what your spirit is saying tonight. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. So just to remind you what's happening in the book of Revelation, the uh, apostle John has been exiled to the island of Patmos, and while he's there, he has a vision of Jesus and you remember Jesus is standing in the middle of seven lampstands. So all around Jesus in this vision are lampstands that are lit with fire. 
And the lampstands represent the seven churches that are being addressed in Asia Minor. Now, most people think these are just random churches, but if you look at a map today, you would know that there was actually a circular route that connected all of these churches. You could take one road and go in one big circle and get all the way around to all seven churches. And so the lampstands represent the seven churches, and Jesus is now looking at each individual lampstand, if you will, and addressing the sin and the, the, the good and the bad things of that church. And so when a church is doing well and God's presence and favor is on it, it's just like a candle being lit. The light is still there. People are still getting saved. The, the, the gospel is still getting preached. It's when a church's light goes out that they should start to get very nervous. When no longer God is the center focus and we're just doing programs just to do them, but there's no illumination of the human soul. And so we're really realizing as we go through this series, each church represents a different type of church. And um, tonight we get into another heavy topic in the church of Thyatira in their sexual immorality. I think you should know right away, the world is always going to be hostile to the church. These churches were experiencing persecution, not because the world they lived in was so accepting of their radical faith in Jesus, but these churches were hostile towards Christians because not they worshiped God, but they didn't worship all the other gods. And so we talked about how last week, not a lot of these churches got persecuted for their, you know, their faith alone in Jesus. It was the exclusivity of their faith. The fact that they said all these other gods are false. We worship God. That's what got them persecution. Uh, The Romans had no problem with you worshiping Jesus if you also worshiped Artemis and you also worshiped Apollo and you also worshiped these other gods. It was when these disciples started saying, we worship God alone, that they started getting persecuted. And so as Jesus writes these churches, there's seven total, five of them get severe warnings and you could even say they get threats from Jesus. Two of them are commended. There is no rebuke for Philadelphia as well as Ephesus. Um, but the other two, I'm sorry, as well as Smyrna, but the other, the other five get rebukes from Jesus. And so all that tells me is not all churches are alike. What one church struggles with might be different from what another church struggles with. Not all churches believe the same thing about worship and how we should engage in the worship service. Not all churches believe that, you know, we should dress a certain way. Uh, Churches might be different in their style. They might be different in their evangelistic approach. But the one thing that every church should have is a pursuit of holiness. What sets the church apart is we are a people that are set apart from everyone else. We are holy in a sense. We want to be holy for God. We don't just come to church because it's a social club. We don't come to church because we agree about ideas. The church, if anything, is the one place in the world where we desire to be made holy. We desire to be made into the image of God. It was the great Charles Spurgeon that said, if your religion doesn't make you holy, it might as well damn you to hell. What he was saying is your belief system, if it doesn't cleanse you of your own problems and your own sin, it is just another thing leading you on your own way. So not every church will deal with the same thing, but every church should be united in a sense that we're set apart from the world. We are the place that when you join and you come, we believe that you will change. It's not just a place that you come and and you're accepted as you are and you stay as you are. It's a place where God welcomes you by grace and then desires to transform your life. The stuff that stressed me out when I was in sin is not even close to stressing me out today. The things I used to worry about when I was in sin is nothing compared to what I worry about today because life has different meaning when you're pursuing righteousness. You, you don't worry about all the stuff that happens at your job or on the news or in these small little petty arguments because your life is focused on holiness and becoming more like Jesus. And so as the churches in Revelation get persecuted, let us not forget, today, Christians will always have people that are hostile to their beliefs. It was Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the German pastor that went back into Nazi infested Germany to pastor his church. Dietrich Bonhoeffer once said, there is a time coming when the world will think we're condemning them just because we hold the beliefs we hold. Just because we think sexuality is an important thing to God. Just because we think what we do with our money really does reveal our soul. Just because we think that life is more than material things, people are gonna assume if they don't believe, we must be condemning them then. 
And so we have to be ready for the time that's ahead. And I'm not one of those, you know, doom and gloom kind of preachers, but as the world gets crazier, I believe the word starts to get clearer. And as things go left in our world and just things start changing and shifting, God wants to make sure his church is going the opposite direction. I say it all the time. As the world zigs, the church has to zag. And so let us be people that pursue that. Uh, I want to just start with maybe an overview of Thyatira. The word Thyatira, the fourth church we're studying tonight, uh, the word literally means unceasing sacrifice. The word Thyatira means unceasing sacrifice. We studied Pergamum last week. Thyatira is 42 miles outside of Pergamum. And here's the thing, if you were coming from Sardis, which is another church we'll get into, and you were going to travel to Pergamum, you would have to go through Thyatira to get to Pergamum. And so it just happened that attacks on Pergamum always started through Thyatira. If somebody wanted to attack Pergamum, y'all remember Pergamum, remember they were up on that hill. It was very favorable to kings because it was built up on a mountain that attackers couldn't just get to them. But if you wanted to attack Pergamum, chances were you were going to attack Thyatira first. And so they dealt with war in the early first and second century. They dealt with different kingdoms trying to come through and take them. It was a hostile place, even in the secular sense. Um, There's various deities in Thyatira. Most famously, Apollo was worshipped there, Artemis, and Tyreminus. Studying this, these gods all week, man, these are some crazy different things I would learn about what they believed Apollo would do for them and how you would kind of have to do a little incense in your altar window. So if you had a house like this with three windows, imagine at each window there was a little altar set up to a different god and most people in their homes would go around to each altar before they would leave and make sure every god was satisfied. Don't you love how the gospel just simplifies things? It says there's one creator, one mediator between man and God, Jesus Christ. Uh, What we know about Thyatira is not much. It's mentioned in uh, Revelation 2, and it's also mentioned in Acts chapter 16. This is the only place in the scriptures that we see Thyatira. So let's turn there really quick. Acts 16 verse 14 is where we get the reference, and I'll cite it for you here. Uh, The apostle Paul writes, one who heard us was a woman named Lydia, from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods, and she was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what had been said by Paul. And so we know that Thyatira was an import exporter of purple thread. This is what Lydia would have been known as. She was a seller of purple because she had access to this purple thread that would be sewn and you know they would make different things about it, but it was well known in the ancient world. Anything that was purple, uh, similar to like your jacket tonight, if you were wearing that in town, they would go, oh, that's from Thyatira. Oh, that purple came from over there. It was well known for that. And so we don't know much about the town beyond that, but we do know that Jesus has something very strongly to say to Thyatira, and we can pick that up in verse 19 of Revelation 2. The Lord writes, I know your works, your love, and your faith, and your service, and your patient endurance, and that your latter works exceed the first. And so love, faith, service, patient endurance, all things that are commended by Jesus. And it's, it's pretty crazy because you can't have one without the other. You can't have faith without having love, and you definitely aren't going to want to serve people unless you have love but you can't have love if you don't have faith and you're definitely not gonna be patient in your service if you don't love and have faith. So Jesus knows all of that. He sees that. It's clear that what they're doing now is better than what they've been doing before. The next verse, he says it right here, the B clause, that your latter works exceed, exceed the first. So he's looking at them and saying, y'all are doing good. You know, I see your faith, I see your love. And he goes, and you're doing more now than you were before. And we must be careful when we do more activity because you can get so good at doing the activity that you forget about the convictions that go into the activity. Thyra Tire is a great example of a church that is too program-minded, but they don't actually focus on calling out sin in people's lives. And that's what we're gonna get into tonight. That's why Jesus placed judgment on this church, not because they were sinning, but because they were allowing sin and they were trying to teach it as some hybrid thing where you could sin and love Jesus, it's okay. And anytime a church is indifferent to sin, it is no longer set apart from the rest of the world. Amen. It's just how it is. You know, we're not a social club. We are 
a holy place trying to pursue a holy God? Are we going to mess up? Absolutely. But the moment that we start telling people, it's okay, you can keep sinning and pursue Jesus, that is dangerous grounds to be on. So Jesus says, I know all that. Verse 20 continues. He has a rebuke too, though. It says, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman. Someone say that woman. I love that. He doesn't say the woman. He says that woman. You tolerate that woman. That girl is poison. Like, I wanted to teach a message on Jezebel called that. That girl's poison. Maybe one day. But I have this against you. You tolerate that woman, Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess and is uh, teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. Jezebel in the Bible is often cited as a symbol of idolatry or wickedness or opposition to God. Uh, the Jezebelic spirit is rebellious by nature. Okay, let, let's go back a verse here and, and let's just see at the beginning there, verse 20, if you don't mind, Jerry. He says, I have this against you. He doesn't say that you have the woman, Jezebel. What's the word that's used? You what? Tolerate the woman, Jezebel. So it's, it's, it's not an external attack coming to your church that's throwing you off. This is from within your church. You are tolerating things, Thyatira, that are actually anti to God. It says you tolerate the woman Jezebel, and she's self-appointed, huh? She calls herself a prophetess. No, no, no one put her in this position. She, she, she came to this position on her own, you know? Watch out for those people that are self-appointed, that just don't ever talk about who blessed them or where they came from or who their pastor is. They just come in, they say, I'm sent by the Lord, and you're like, well, who's your covering? They're like, you know, my YouTube channel. You know what I mean? It's like, no, do you have a pastor? Like, do you have someone covering you? Or is it just you're here and you're doing your thing? So Jezebel is self-appointed. She's self-promoted. A couple other things about who Jezebel is. First, Jezebel was a Phoenician princess. She was the daughter of King Ethabal of Tyre, a region in present-day Lebanon. And so she is Phoenician. She comes out of Tyre. We know that she married a man named Ahab. Now, the thing about Ahab is he was the king of Israel at the time. And when her and Ahab got together, uh, all that Jezebel ever knew was Baal worship. She was taught to worship Baal. Uh, much of Baal worship has to do with sexual, sexual immorality, um, you know, temple prostitutes and like these big sex groups where they all come together to worship in one room all together. That was all Baal worship. It was common for that to be normal in ancient worship. And Ahab marries Jezebel. And instead of Jezebel turning from Baal worship, Jezebel actually influences Ahab to make Baal worship legal in Israel. And so Ahab's the king of Israel. He marries Jezebel. And now he says, hey, all of Yahweh's people, we're going to worship Baal now. It's kind of better that way. And so from the jump, she had a political thing on her that she got an entire nation to worship Baal. Ahab was influenced by Jezebel to worship Baal, leading to the introduction of Baal worship in Israel. She actively promoted Baal worship. She killed God's prophets who did not align with Baal worship. And her death, many of you guys have heard of her death. Her death was prophesied by Elijah. Her death went something like this. She was thrown out of a window and her body was consumed by dogs. I wish I had time to walk you all the way through it. There's some stuff in there that just hauntingly feels eerily sim similar to today. Um, but Jezebel's death happened like thousands and thousands of years you know, ago. I mean, this, this was probably 27, 2800 years ago. For John, it would have been about 800 years ago. And so Jezebel, the person is dead, but her spirit definitely lives on. Her spirit is demonic by nature. A Jezebel spirit is somebody who, who basically, you know, from the inside of something will start spewing lies to try to get people to turn on their convictions. Um, she is somebody that says, don't worry about it. You can do what you want and God will allow you to keep doing things. She was indifferent to sin. So can you understand the difference now? A church like last week that we read when we were talking about Pergamum, they were getting attacked from the outside. They were getting persecution from the government coming in and saying, you can't worship Jesus. This church is not getting attacked from the outside. It's someone from the inside that is actually spewing this cancer into the church that says you can sin and God won't care. I, I'm interested just in verse 20 what it says, but I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel and then the next verse, he says, I gave her time to repent, but she refuses to repent of her sexual immorality. 
And so there's two words that interest me just as a pastor when I read this. One is, uh, we read it the verse before, it says, you tolerate that woman. And then the second verse, it says, I've called her to repent. And so tolerate and repent are, are at odds with each other. Okay, you can't call somebody to repentance and them still tolerate their old way of life. You, you can't say, yes, I repent of my sin, but I still tolerate sin. That, that, that's, that doesn't work. It's an oxymoron. The moment that you repent of something, you're saying, I no longer tolerate it in my life. And so in the scriptures, in the NIV translation, the word tolerate appears eight times in the whole Bible. The word repent appears 41 times. And so that would show that God wants us to repent more than he wants to tolerate things. Tolerate in our world is celebrate, celebrated. Tolerance is a big thing right now. Can you, you know, and I'm not talking about like tolerate living and coexisting with society. I'm not talking about people are different than you. You can't tolerate them. I'm saying in your faith, do you tolerate that which is clearly marked sin? I can go to church with anybody. I can be in the United States with anybody. It doesn't matter their religion. I can have a conversation with anybody. It doesn't matter their race, their religion. None of that matters. But in the church, do we tolerate things that are clearly sin? America, we just, all we do is when we tolerate sin, all we do is just start new denominations. That's how we do with it. We're like, do we agree on sin here? One half the church says no. The other half says yes. Okay, let's just start a denomination then. And what we've done is we have just allowed this to continue. Just people not teaching the word. And we say, okay, just don't want to hurt feelings. Let's start another one. And that's not what Jesus is speaking to in this chapter. He's calling us higher. What is sexual immorality? Well, I'll give you a quick definition. I would say plainly, sexual immorality is neglecting and defying God's law of sexual relations. God cares deeply about what we do with our bodies, not just sexually, but even with how we eat. Gluttony is just as much as a sin as sexual immorality. How you take care of your body shows a lot about how you think of God. Um, you know, stewardship is a real principle. And so he gives us commands. He gives us laws for how we should treat our body. The word sexual morality in the Greek is the word porneia. And we see it 25 times in the New Testament. Uh, this word appears in 1 Corinthians. It appears in Romans 1. It appears in 1 Timothy 1. Uh, whenever the Bible talks about lust, famously Jesus said, uh, if you look at a woman with lust in your heart, that is sin. He was saying, if you, pornea, if you have sexual immorality after someone who's not your wife, that is sin. So 25 times this word appears, and it could be best defined as a surrendering of sexual purity. You see a surrendering of sexual purity. You know, no one took it from you. It was a surrendering. When it was a, a knowing, when you knowingly did it and you went into it knowing. I'm, I'm not talking about somebody taking abuse or, you know, I'm not talking about like rape or anything like that. I'm talking about knowingly sin. No one took that. You surrendered your purity. And you laid it down. That's what Jesus speaks to. He says, watch out. For Jezebel that says that's okay to do that. In the Old Testament, laws were given to Israelites um, to discourage sexual immorality. And, and, you know, it was like sexual misconduct, like incest, bestiality. You know, the Old Testament gives us great laws civilly for that. But in the New Testament, Jesus taught that any sexual relation outside of marriage was immor immoral. And so that, that was his stance on it. Anything outside of marriage is immoral. He taught lusting after a woman. Hebrews talks about keeping the marriage bed undefiled. Um, you know, I know it's a heavy topic, but this is where we are tonight. The, the church of Thyatira had dealt with sexual immorality. And God is very, I don't know, I, I don't want to say God is judging, but it definitely feels like judgment sometimes on our country for the very same thing that the sexual revolution of the 60s and then the continuing in the 70s and 80s of how much our culture fell in love with sex, you very well could say that there is a judgment upon modern day society for that. I'm not old school in a sense, you know, that we're like, oh, you know, you can't date or you can't, there's some laws that were crazy for back then. But the very basics of sexual purity, I think we've lost that in our country. And uh, that is something that God speaks to directly. 1 Corinthians 6 says this about sexual immorality. It says, flee from sexual immorality. Don't try to fight it. Don't try to overcome it. 
Don't try to sit there and do a whole study about it before you make a decision about it. It says, if you tempted with it, run. You know, one of my favorite stories where this is illustrated is the story of Joseph. If you remember in the first 50 chapters of Genesis, we get great events and then we get stories about great people. And so Genesis 1 through 11 is all great events, creation, the fall of man, Noah's Ark, Tower of Babel. And then the rest of the book is about people, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. And then one of Jacob's sons is named Joseph. Joseph ends up getting a job with uh, the Egyptians, works for a man named Potiphar. One day he's in Potiphar's house and he's risen up in the ranks in Potiphar's house and Potiphar's wife comes and says, why don't you lay with me? And he says, absolutely not. I cannot betray Potiphar. I won't do that thing. And the text says, day after day, she nagged him constantly. Why don't you lay with me? Why don't you lay with me? Finally, one day she went and just grabbed his coat and said, lay with me. And the Bible says he stripped off his coat and ran away. He left the coat and ran away. That's how big he felt like this was wrong. He didn't even want to be associated with it. And still, she still lied about him, got him caught up anyways. But the principle is when you are in a moment like that, you might as well just change the channel, fast forward the scene, tell somebody, let's get out of here. I didn't sign up for this because we can't try to overcome it on our own strength. You know, it's, it's not a fearful thing to run when you know it's something that could end your life. Not, this isn't to fight a battle, you know. Some things just get them out of your head, get them out of your space. Let's continue. Revelation 2, we're gonna read verse 22 now. We get an idea, Jezebel. We got an idea what she's doing. It says that she was teaching and seducing her, uh, the servants of the Lord to practice sexual immorality and eat food sacrificed to idols, which is a call to the occult. And they would do these rituals where they would, you know, worship, but then also designate special food as offering. And you were considered unclean participating in any of those rituals in the Jewish view of things. Okay, verse 22 of Revelation 2, it says, Behold, I will throw her onto a sick bed." And those who commit adultery with her, I will throw into great tribulation unless they repent of her works. This is, this is wild because verse 23 says, I will strike her children dead. This is Jesus threatening to strike the children of Jezebel dead. You know, you can't preach this on Sunday morning because people won't come back. (laughs) You know what I mean? But we got to remember the first time Jesus comes, it's with love and grace. In his second coming, he comes with wrath and judgment. And it's it's something that is a part of our theology. We know that he's going to return. It doesn't mean we don't preach love and grace and forgiveness of sin. It's because we know that, that we preach love and grace and forgiveness of sin. We know that judgment's coming. Jesus wants his church pure. And he's threatening Tyra, Tyra here to do something about it. Uh, I was talking to Paul there in the book of Acts and their Bible study on Fridays right now. And, you know, Acts chapter five, there's a story about Ananias and Sapphira, two disciples, if you will, two apostles that had lied and had kept money for themselves. They, they dropped dead right in the meeting. The Holy Spirit uses a moment. There's a scripture in 1 Corinthians 11 where Paul is talking about the Lord's Supper. And and he talks about how we should come to the Lord's Supper with reverence. He says we should come to the Lord's Supper and examine our hearts. And then he says, and when we don't, God judges that. And he says, some of you are sick and some of you have fallen asleep for that reason. Go read it, it's in there. 1 Corinthians 11, he says, some of y'all are sick and dead because you don't approach the Lord's Supper the right way. That's a big deal. What does that tell you? Jesus wants his church pure. He says, I'm going to strike your children dead. The next verse, verse 23, says, and all the churches will know that I am he who searches mind and heart. Why would he, why would he say that? Almost as if he wants to do this to Thyatira if they don't repent so that all the other churches will know that he is the one who searches. You know what this tells me? There must have been more churches like Thyatira then. There must have been a lot of other churches that were indifferent to sin. And what he's saying is, I'm going to do this to Thyra Tower so that all these churches know I search the mind and I search the heart. Oh, it's great that you have great endurance. It's great that you have faith and love, Thyra Tyra, but I see your heart. 
and I see that what you used to be convicted about, you're now kind of nonchalant about. And what used to make you just, oh, tremble if you were to do it again, you've now integrated it into your theology that it's okay to do it in your mind. It says, all the churches will know that I am he who what searches heart and mind. Jesus says he knows the depths of our sin. He knows how much our mind is attached to sin. He knows how much our heart is attached to sin. Jesus isn't like on the other side of this. He knows it. He knows the depth of what it means to be addicted. I mean, I remember trying to get off drugs when I first met Jesus and, you know, continued to do drugs for like the first two years I was a Christian, just sniffing lines here, smoking weed there, just trying to, trying to fathom how I was going to integrate off of that. And I remember somebody in my church coming up to me one time and saying, you know, Jesus understands the depth of your addiction. And I just, I just remember like being taken aback by it. Like, and he says, you think that like Jesus is over here and you're trying to get it together and then you're going to come to Jesus like all. And he, he said, no, Jesus knows the depth of your addiction. He knows psychologically how much it messes with you. It's addiction's like a snake. It, it wraps around your neck. It's like a snake that just shows up and starts, you don't even know it's there until all of a sudden just squeezes the life out of you. And when Jesus says, I am he who searches hearts and minds, let us look at our own sin and realize he knows the depths of why we do what we do. It's not always gonna justify it, but it should prompt us to come to him in a heart of repentance. You know, oh, I want revival, I want revival. Well, it starts with repentance. We won't have revival in our world until there's repentance in the church. Yeah, I'm preaching that tonight. That there's got to be a revival, right? Yes, Jesus is going to return. It's going to be a big revival. Okay, but repentance has to go first. And unless the church gets cleaned up as a whole, unless the church repents of her sin, unless the church comes to terms with maybe we aren't as united as we think, we're not going to see revival in our country. That's something that should be clear. So here's three things on how to have a revival that I believe, you know, people talk about our church, uh, you know, starting a revivalist, and you will know when you're in revival. Like, yes, we have seen some great things happen at our church, but Joel talks about in the end times, there's going to be a huge revival where God's spirit is poured out, and it, it, you'll, there won't be a seat available. You'll have people dying to get inside. You'll have people waiting in the parking lot saying, I just want to hear the word. I just want to hear how to be saved. You'll, you'll know it's revival when your coworkers are coming to you saying, how can I be saved? You'll know it's revival when in schools, there's kids that are getting their kids saved and there's worship happening on public schools. Like, I don't want to discount revival. I love it. You know, who doesn't love a good revival? But we must first realize before we have revival out there, it's got to start with something in here. So three things to have a revival. First, refresh our first love for Christ. If I, if I want to see a revival in Chautauqua County, and I'm talking like every church that has the word church on their building, all coming together, you know, at the fairgrounds and doing a night of worship on the bleachers, you know what I mean? Like we're not going to see that kind of stuff until our love for Christ is refreshed. Like, I don't love church. Like, I love Jesus. And if I love Jesus, naturally I'll love church. Does that make sense? I don't love preaching. I love Jesus. You know, I don't, I, I, like, like I, 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 don't, I don't look at, like, parenting and say, wow, I love to be a parent. That's my first thing. I say, I love Jesus, therefore I love parenting, even when it's hard. So when my, my focus is on him and loving him, everything else makes more sense. The, I, I was sharing a few weeks ago about just how I feel like the Lord's been refreshing my first love for him lately and, you know, how intimate a moment with him can get. It doesn't have to be like you wake up and you have your Bible reading and then you have your prayer time and then you have this awesome journal entry. If that's your flow, that's great. Like if you have a good routine in the mornings or at night with God, that's great. But sometimes all he needs is just one moment where you're completely surrendered to him. And your phone isn't around and there's not a person in sight and you have nothing in your head but him and desiring him. Sometimes I'll sit there and just breathe in and out until I can sense his presence. You know, it doesn't take all that. And so I believe the first thing we gotta do is refresh our first love. Wanna see a revival in your family? Refresh your love for Jesus. 
You know, you want to see a turnaround in some friends' lives? Refresh your love for Jesus. I think the church of Thyatira wasn't going to see uh, repentance from sexual immorality unless there was first love experience there. Remember, it was Ephesus, wasn't it? That was their comment, uh, what Jesus rebuked them for. He said, I, I have this against you. You forgot your first love. Revelation 2, verse 4 says, I know your works. You're doing great. Because, but you forgot your first love. Ephesus actually was really good at calling out sin in others. He says, you, don't, you guys don't tolerate false prophets. He goes, that's awesome. But you forgot to love me. When we were thinking about planting the church and I was studying the Western New York area, it was like 2020, just the beginning of the pandemic. I remember uh, reading a scripture in Matthew 7 where Jesus says on the last day, people are gonna come to me and they're gonna say, Lord, we cast out demons in your name. We did all this work in your name. We preached sermons in your name. And Jesus is gonna say, I never knew you. Depart from me, you worker of iniquity. And when I started thinking about Western New York, I started thinking about people in this area, the tradition in this area, that scripture came to life in me. There's gonna be people that say, but I went to church. I went to church, Jesus, you're not gonna let me in. He's going to say, depart from me. I never knew you. That, that, that freaks me out a little bit. Not in like a I'm afraid of God thing, but I want to get urgent in how we reach more people. Imagine on the final day, you're standing there on the gates of heaven and you're excited because you're going to heaven and then you see a friend from high school behind you or you see a coworker, or you see your annoying neighbor or you see that person that you try to avoid and they sit there and say, you know, I knew you were a Christian. How come you never told me about this? Like, I don't want to get there and my friends from high school look at me and they're like, I'm glad you became a pastor and got saved, but you never said it was going to be like this. We got to refresh our love so that we can reach people for him. Secondly, to have a revival, we need to repent from compromising with the world. We need to repent from compromising with the world. I mean, I was a youth pastor for years. I can understand how the church starts to integrate things from the world. You know, we want to be relevant and we want to reach people. And we say things like, we'll do anything but sin to reach people. And it's like, okay, well, when do you start compromising, though, on what God says it's holy just to reach people? You know, if you're called to preach the word or live the word or be, you know, do it whether someone's there or not. Do it whether you have support or not. Preach the word whether your family's in agreement or not. You know, it's, it's, it's do it whether the seats are full or not. Compromise is what killed this church. And I think compromise is what kills the witness of the church today. It's because we've seen pastors lie about things. We've seen men and women in authority, you know, uh, scandals left and right in the modern day church. Like accusations, at least every other month now, there's some big prominent pastor getting accused of something. And it has caused people to lessen their reverence for God. You know, there used to be a time when if you were chewing gum in the parking lot, one of the ushers would tell you, spit the gum out. Now we're like, hey, everyone, just, just we want you comfortable. We just want you comfortable. We just want you comfortable. We just want you comfortable. It's like, when does that become dangerously close to compromise? So refresh our first love for Christ. Second, repent from the compromising world. And third, how to have revival, rebuke sin openly. Of course, do it in love. What Jesus says here is the problem is there is sin and no one's saying anything. No one is saying it's sin. No one's saying it's wrong. Like if, if the pastor's job isn't to put a sermon together, just get up and say what's black and what's white. You know what I mean? Like, we just have to be clear to people. Because I think there's people today that desperately want to know. Not even lost people that are looking for an out in their life, but I think there's Christians that want to know, is this right or wrong? Should I do this or not do this? Can I tell them this or not tell them this? And I don't necessarily think that, you know, the best way to reach somebody is to rebuke them. I don't know how much these guys on the streets, how successful they are. You're going to hell, repent, turn. You know, I don't know how real effective how street preachers are. But, but I do think there is a call. If you're in a local church and you're doing life with somebody and all of a sudden you see they're in sin, you have a responsibility to call them to repentance. I, I might not know what's going on in you know, four rows in and the guy sitting on the corner, but his small group leader might know. And I expect if his small group leader is a Christian and he sees them sinning, he's gonna say, hey, dude, that's wrong. I, what's causing you to go that route? Is there something in you that is making you choose that way instead of God's way? 
to rebuke it as your conviction, to do it openly as your transparency, and to do it in love is your requirement as a Christian. So you definitely should rebuke it because we have a conviction to righteousness. You should do it openly. Not necessarily like, and you know, I don't think you're gonna see me on a Sunday telling one person you're a sinner in front of the whole church. Like, but I think you should be able to go to somebody openly and say, hey, I wanna talk to you about something that's been on my heart. I've been thinking about it. That shows that you're a real person. And when you do it with love, well, it's the only way Jesus commands us to do it. Ephesians 4 says we should speak the truth in love. So say what you need to say, but sometimes how you say something is just as important as what you say. So you can rebuke somebody in hate. You can rebuke somebody in jealousy. You can rebuke somebody in arrogance. You can rebuke, rebuke somebody in your pride. But the command of a Christian is to rebuke in love. And let me help you out too. Ephesians 5 says, don't rebuke older men, but treat them as fathers. And so rebuke is something you do when you have equity built up with somebody, you know that person, you know, um, I, I feel the responsibility as a pastor sometimes to rebuke older men, like if it's, a contra- if it's something that threatens like the church culture, but like I'm not going up to the average person and talking to them about their anger issues, that's for somebody in their life to do that. I'm not going to go talk to somebody, you know, about their sexual sin, that's for somebody that knows them to do that. If they bring it, absolutely, I'll rebuke them, but at the same time, I trust as we grow as Christians Uh, We do it openly in love. So that was the sin that Thyatira dealt with. But what about the Christians that are there that didn't fall into that? Because not every church is the same. And, And not, you know, just because a little bit of sin happens in a church, it doesn't mean every person in the church accepts that as sin. Here's what Jesus says in verse 24. He says, but to the rest of you in Thyatira who do not hold this teaching, The rest of you that live there because that's where you live. You can't leave. The rest of you that are just, that's where God has placed you. He says, you don't hold this teaching. Who have not learned what some call the deep things of Satan. To you I say, I do not lay on you any other burden. Only hold fast what you have until I come. Jesus knows whose are his. And he, he holds them like jewels in his hands. In the middle of compromise and Christians succumbing to the world, Jesus says, I see the rest of you that have a heart for me. And he called the, the teaching, he said, uh, the deep things of Satan. This teaching that they're teaching in Thyatira, some have learned it, it is so bad that Jesus calls it the deep things of Satan, this Libertonian kind of teaching, like live however you want, do what you're free to do, like indifference to sin, he calls the deep things of Satan. It's a very dualistic kind of teaching. It's like you, you can do anything you want, you know what I mean? And, and it's contrary to a life that Jesus calls us to. The deep thing of Satan is teaching that, that says God is indifferent to your sin and he will tolerate your immorality. This is what he means when he says, some are calling this the deep things of Satan. Because it's basically saying God is indifferent to your sin. So you sin, it's all good. God, God's good. He loves you. And how many know he does love us? But if, if someone loves us, don't they want the best for us? Like my dad loves me, but every time I would come home after doing something stupid or doing something wrong as a teenager, he was quick to tell me, you know, that's wrong. I never took it as like, wow, you don't love me. It was like, yeah, I probably shouldn't steal your car in the middle of the night without a license. You're right. That's wrong. Yeah, I probably shouldn't, you know, lie, cheat, and steal. Yeah, you're right. Like, it's not, it's not wrong for us to be called to a higher standard. Worship in the ancient world was always connected to immorality. And so, you know, don't buy into that lie that you can always just be you. You know, God definitely created you. He made you with a purpose but he calls you to a higher standard. And some people think their sin has no consequence. Um, that, that is the deep things of Satan. Do what you want and nothing will happen. Or this one, do what you want as long as it doesn't hurt anybody else. And what we do is we build up this, this passivity towards righteousness. And we're like, well, I've, I've worked it out in my head why I can do it. We become our own judge. Some people think they can mess with the things of Satan and it'll have no effect on them. (laughs) I am not that strong, my friends. I have the power through Jesus, but there are definitely things I don't want in my life. 
You know, to have some standards in your life and say, no, I don't watch that, don't listen to that, we don't have any of that stuff, that, that doesn't mean that you're weak or something. I believe Jesus has authority all over all that, but I don't have to invite it. I don't have to be around it. I don't have to approve of it. You know, I have a bunch of family and a bunch of friends that are living in, in different ways, and, and I don't approve of their life, but I can still accept them into my life. You know what I mean? I can still see them and, and be cordial with them. I don't have to always, you know, call them to repentance. You're the worst, you're the worst, you're the worst. I can see them, love them, have a conversation. But when those lines get blurred, I got to make sure I know who I am. Let's finish off here as we land this plane. We're in verse 26 now. We get to the end of the section. It says, to the one who conquers and who keeps my works until the end, I will give authority over the nations. And he will rule them with a rod of iron as when earthen pots are broken into pieces. Even I myself have received authority from my father. And I will give him the morning star. And he who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the spirit says to the churches. First in verse 26, he says, to the one who conquers and keeps my works. It's, it's an overcoming that Jesus is looking for. He's saying to the one that gets through this persecution, who doesn't compromise, maybe loses some friends over it, but stays true to the way that God uh, has, has, has designed you and, and stay true to your convictions, to the one who overcomes, he's going to promise some things. We demonstrate the reality of our salvation when we conquer things, when we overcome things. We demonstrate the reality that we're saved when we push past where everyone else stops. And we say, I'm a Christian. Of course not, I don't do that. John, 1 John uh, chapter 5 says, the one who overcomes is the one who has faith in Christ. So to conquer through the temptations of this world is because your faith is set on Christ. To the one who conquers and keeps my works, he says, I will give authority over the nations. I want you to just think about how big of a deal this is. Jesus himself says, you will get authority over the nations. You're gonna rule with Jesus. You will rule and reign with Jesus one day. That is the promise of eternal life. We'll be rewarded according to our works, but the promise is that he gives us that authority. And then if we do conquer and we do overcome, it says that he will give the morning star. I guess verse 28 says that, and I will give him the morning star. Sexual immorality is often associated with darkness. Sin itself is often associated with darkness. Jesus is light. And so when he says, I will give you the morning star, we don't have much here on the morning star, but one of the, pre one of the principles of, of interpreting the Bible is scripture always interprets scripture. And so when you see something in the scripture, there's the law first mentioned, which is, okay, let's go into the beginning of the Bible and find out the first time this idea was mentioned. And then there's the scripture interprets scripture. So one verse, there is somewhere else in the Bible that will interpret it. This works sometimes pretty good, other times not so much. But here's verse 20, uh, 16 of Revelation 22. Here's how we know who the bright and morning star is. Later on in the book, he says, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give you this testimony for the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David. And Jesus himself says, and the bright and morning star. So now when you take that in consideration of Revelation chapter 2, what Jesus says is, if you conquer, I give you myself. You have access to me. You don't just get the kingdom, you get the king. You, you don't just get to be a part of something, you get access to the king. My first job um, in the Palm Springs area was working for the Marriott. And Marriott is a great place to work for, you know, big corporation, all kinds of perks and stuff. I remember getting a job working in the valet parking booth. And um, when you join the Marriott, they tell you, here, you're going to get a Marriott card, and now you have access to the, you know, the amenities, like you can get, not for the guests, but like for the employees. You know, you have a cafeteria, and you have a little lounge area, and, and because you're a part of this thing, you have access to the whole thing. So one day, I was getting ready to go on break, and just in the little parking booth, I mean, you know, there's a special place in hell that just has parking booths, you know what I mean? This is, I was in there, joking, but I was in there for five years, and, and I, I was just in the parking booth, and it was like the last customer of the day, and they come up, and I turned over, and it was the general manager of the whole hotel driving this nice car. And, and he goes up, and he says, you know, I don't have my pass. He goes, you know, I'm so-and-so, and he says his name, and right away, I knew who he was, and I was like, oh, hi, Mr. So-and-so, absolutely, let me just let you out, and got him out really quick, did the little code that let the gate go up, and he said, hey, thank you, and he says, you're new around here, huh? 
And I said, yeah, I've just started a college kid. He says, you ever want to have lunch? Go into the lounge. I'm there every day at one o'clock. Would love to sit and talk with you. General manager of the hotel. I'm like 17-year-old kid out of high school, you know, first job, nervous as can be. And they tell me, you don't just get access to the cafeteria. I got to meet the man that runs the whole place. See, it's one thing when you have access to God's kingdom and the benefits of his blessings and all that he promises you. It's another thing when you have access to him and you get to be with him and you get to go directly to him. The king is given to those that conquer. You get Jesus. You get eternity with Jesus. I can't even fathom the peace that we'll feel when we're face to face with him. As I close, I want to just remind you what verse 29 says. At the end of every chapter, every letter, every church that gets addressed, Jesus says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. What do you hear tonight when you think of Thyatira, a church that had great activity, faith, and endurance, They were also a church that allowed pagan idolatry to get comfortable in it. The compromising church is a church that's under judgment but did nothing about it. As Christians, this is why God has given us his word so we know what right and wrong is. He's given us his word as an ultimate standard so we can't just pick and choose. You know, in our church, we're okay with these sins but not these sins. No, the Bible is the authority. Um, As a Christian you know, I've always believed that the Bible is the ultimate source of authority. Um, Catholics, who are also Christians, but they would say that the ultimate th- source of authority is tradition and church and the Bible. And so as Protestants, you know, we typically say, here's our authority. Everything in here is what goes. Uh, Catholics would say, yes, we believe the Bible, but also the church has authority. And so if the Pope wants to say something, he can say something. And this is just as of like two weeks ago, same-sex couples now in the Catholic Church are being blessed. And there's all this kind of like ambiguity because, you know, the Pope said, well, not really. At first he was like, we're going to bless them, but we can't make it seem like a marriage. And then, you know, his theology guy, the right-hand guy that oversees all the theology in the Catholic Church pretty much pushed it again. And they sent it back again to be approved. And it was approved. Now you're seeing churches all around the world reject it. So like the Ukrainian Catholic Church put a big statement out and says, we do not side with the Pope. I'm just telling you, keep your eyes open, your ears open. What does all this mean? When you see big stuff happening that represent movements and ideologies and history, um, it doesn't mean that it's all corrupt. It doesn't mean that every Catholic is the worst. It It just means that the foundations of our world are starting to shake a little bit, you know? Big accusation against T.D. Jakes is out in the open now. In the last two weeks, people have been talking about Jakes being in all this stuff. T.D. Jakes, big, prominent movement figure. You're talking 50 years of ministry. There's a whole campaign now to discredit him. I mean, these things matter. Not that they send us running for the hills scared, but they make us realize the devil's working. And he can't destroy the church, but he sure does want to distract us. So let's be men, let's be women of God that stay committed to God's word. And even when religious activity tries to hypnotize us and makes us think, look what we're doing, look what we're doing. If we're not standing on what's truth, we're not doing it.